So we believe God and, and we're thankful to God. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to the book of Luke, the 11th chapter. Luke, the 11th chapter, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke, the 11th chapter. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke. You have it, just say amen. Amen. Starting at verse number one. Teaching about prayer, once Jesus was in a certain place praying, as he finished praying, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. Verse number two, and he said unto them, when ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done as in heaven so in earth give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil deliver us from evil i, I want you to do me a favor and go back to verse number two and I want us to read verse number two again. There we'll find our key text where we'll get our message from today. Said unto them, when you pray, say our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. As in heaven, so in earth. On earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, so in earth. I want to talk to you today, and I want to continue with the theme for this month. I want to continue to discuss and continue to be brief about prayer. Prayer today, that's, that's on our heart, that's on our mind. Everyone needs to know about prayer. Everyone needs access to prayer. But let's not assume that all of us know how to pray. Let's not assume that because we've been around people that have prayed, because we've been in establishments where prayer goes forward, let's not assume that everyone knows how to pray correctly even. And I just, God just settled this in my, in my spirit uh, to, today, this, this morning. And, and really, I'm, I'm, I'm in a new part of my life right now. Uh, I find myself uh, these days... Danielle, I'm very sensitive these days. Very sensitive. I, I uh, you know, maybe a little too sensitive uh, uh, sometimes. Uh, uh, some might say you're just more grumpy than you are sensitive on occasions. But, but in my in my old young age, I've become very sensitive. I'm, I've become very sensitive to sarcasm. Uh, very sensitive to undertones. Uh, I've been a, a, a very sensitive to cynicism. I, I, I'm getting very sensitive in my old age, and it's, it, 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 and it's making me re react some type of way, amen? And, and, and what I'm really sensitive towards more than anything, I, I think this is what gets me going, is around people that lack politeness, where it's uncharacteristic of them to be polite to other people and, and maybe some say well maybe you're in the wrong generation then because that's that's all we recognize and and, and, and and so it's because of this that that my tolerance is probably not where it should be y'all pray for me because God's working it out with tribulation amen and and, and and so it's because of that because I'm I'm going through a phase or a season of of sensitivity I, it's funny because we heard of of, of of menstrual cycles I I have what they call men struggle cycles mm -hmm, that's what I'm dealing with because because I believe that these are gender specific these are just struggles of a man I prefer to look at them as just struggles of a grown man and that's what I'm going through right now, Daniel. You got to pray for me. I'm going through grown man struggles. But one thing that I'm becoming more and more sensitive or alert to is, is when, when people are polite and when they are not polite. Amen? 
Uh, I, I can tell, and I like uh, Pastor Tanika, how she, she taught a great lesson on the, on the spiritual gifts. One of the gifts was the gift of helps. And I can tell that I do not have the gift of helps. Because if I help you, I want you to say thank you. If you come to me for any type of help, I want you to say please first. And so I, I, I know that, that, that whenever you approach me, and one thing that gets gets me boiling is if you ever approach me and you don't know how to ask me for what you need correctly. I might ignore your texts. I might not respond to your email. I might just sit there and have a stare down with you for about five minutes. But unless you know how to ask me for what you need the right way, I probably won't respond. But, but I'd like to think that I got this, this feeling or this, this type of sensitivity. I'd like to think that I got it from God. Because anybody that approaches God, if you want God to respond to a need, if you, you want God to respond to something that's going on in your life, you better learn how to ask him the right way. No, don't just throw stuff at me and say, here you go. I'm going to throw it back. Amen. I'll get on a waitress if she, she comes and, and it, it, it throws me, it actually gives me the tip before, it gives me the bill before she takes all my plates. I'm just, I'm just keen and sensitive, but most importantly, I'm keen and sensitive to the fact of how people ask for things, but God is too. I dare say that the reason why God has not responded to our prayers correctly or effectively is because we haven't been asking them the right way. So the Lord brought me here today. He brought me here today to deal with this text, the model prayer. Some call it the sinner's prayer. But this text right here sticks out because they come to Jesus and the first thing they say to Jesus is they say to him, we need you to show us how to pray to God. The word prayer there literally means ask in Greek. In other words, we need you to show us how to go before God and learn how to ask him appropriately. But this is where I'm a, little, I'm a little disturbed at by the text. If we know anything about the disciples and the background of the disciples, these were religious men out of a religious family, had a religious upbringing. They grew up around the temple. They grew up as little temple boys going to service, doing the things of the temple. How is it you've been around church your whole life? But yet you're coming to God for the first time at 20-something, 30-something years old, and you admit that it's been 20-something years of being on this earth, 30-something years of being on this earth, even growing up in the church, but I still don't know how to pray the right way. Jesus, I need you to show us how to ask God. I need you to show us how to get through to God effectively. Somebody say effective. We need to be effective because the, the, the truth of the matter is this. I have been praying. The truth of the matter is I pray consistently every time, every day. But here's the sad truth of the matter. I ain't getting no results. I ask, I look up to heaven. I got the right prayer posture. I look up to heaven. My arms are folded. My legs are folded. My, my legs are crossed. My hands are folded on my legs. I, 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 I'm performing the right prayer posture, but I'm not getting the right results from prayer. Nothing's happening. And this is where most of us are because we pray expecting God not to move. What are you talking about, Cephas? We pray specifically with the expectation that he's not going to do what I'm praying him, what I'm praying or what I'm asking him for. What do you mean? It's, it's what I call the lottery sweepstakes mentality. I'm going to show you the difference. Um, I'm a, back in the day, I was a Bulls fan. So I was a Michael Jordan's Bull fan. And so I was confident that every time Michael got on the court, he was going to hit the other team up for 30 points. Was I guaranteed that he was going to do 30? No, but I was pretty confident based on the career based on all the high scoring games that Michael Jordan did, based on all the game winning shots, I knew that when Michael Jordan got on the court, he was about to clown somebody. 
Amen? But, but, but most of us can believe in Michael Jordan. Most of us have more confidence in our favorite team. We have more confidence in our favorite sports athlete. We have confidence even in some of the concerts that we go to that my music, oh, Prince is gonna put on a performance tonight. Oh my, he got a purple guitar with him tonight. It's gonna be a real good performance. We're more confident in our entertainers, our sports professionals, even some of our favorite speakers. We believe that when they get up to the podium, they have a word or they have a good speech to tell us. But when it comes to asking God, we don't have that same mentality. We have more of a lottery ticket mentality. I'm going to play the lottery. I don't expect to win. But if I do, praise God. That's how we treat prayer. The reason why I can tell that is because how you react when God actually comes through for a prayer for you that you actually prayed. Chris, why is Danielle rolling on the carpet and, and, and crying uncontrollably? Why is Dave yelling out and, 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 and acting like he just won the lottery sweepstakes? Why, why is he acting like that? Why aren't we just as confident we take on the same mentality as if our play, favorite player is going up there to execute a game like we know that they can do? Why don't we have that same confidence with God? I expect Michael Jordan to show out when he gets on the, on the court. Why don't we expect God to perform what he said he was going to do? But we treat him more like a lottery ticket. If he does it, it's like, it's like the shock of the world to me if he actually does what I, what I asked him for, what, he, what I prayed to him about. If he actually comes through on it, I'm shocked because I really wasn't expecting God to answer. I really wasn't expecting God to move on my prayer. I really didn't believe that he would hear little old me when I sat down. I really didn't expect to be delivered this time because I've been asking every Sunday for the last five years. I really didn't expect for this person to come back home. Why? Because I've been asking for the last 10 years and nothing's happened. So, so, so we had this lottery ticket mentality and, 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 and we're holding on and we're holding out for God, expecting him to show up. But when he doesn't show up, it's almost like we use it to have it out to say, I, I didn't think it would happen for me anyway. Mm. So here it is. We have people that not only not know how to pray, but we have people that feed into our lack of understanding of knowing how to pray. They sit around and they pray. They, they sit around and pray on the week and they feed in with more of their inaccuracies. To tell us, man, maybe you would be more effective in prayer if you ran around the church more. Maybe you would be more effective in prayer if you gave more money during offering. Maybe you would be more effective in prayer if you came more often. Maybe you would be more effective in prayer if you weren't so bad. Maybe you would be more effective in prayer if you stopped cussing so much. Maybe you would be more effective in prayer if you changed your attitude. Maybe, maybe he would actually listen to you for a change if you were as faithful and consistent as you should be maybe if you actually gave more to the poor maybe if you did this maybe if you you did that so so not only do I have my own insecurities that I'm dealing with about God not responding to my prayer but I got a lot of quarterback prophets trying to tell me what I need to do to hear from God that's totally false somebody say help us Lord but I like the disciples mentality this messes me up right here. The disciples, I like their mentality. They, they, they determine within themselves, if I need to learn how to pray, why not ask God how I should pray? Messes me up because, because if you ever want to know what to get me for my birthday, Joe, which is August 29th, by the way. If you ever want to know what it's on a Sunday. If you ever want to know what to get me for my birthday, don't ask Brykea. Don't ask Roman. Don't ask Zaya. Come to me and ask me. I'll tell you what you can get me. Amen. There is an Xbox One down at GameStop that has Shantae written all over it. And it is ordained to be mine. Amen. You want to know what 
Shantae wants. If you want to know what Shantae likes, you ask Shantae. That's why I thank God for the mall. I, I, can, I can shop in the mall in 10 minutes. I go to the shop mall section at Bonds and Albertsons where it says shopping mall with all the gift cards on it. And I can shop for everybody in 10 minutes. Why? Because I've given up on trying to ask people what size you wear. Because you're just going to lie to me anyway or you're going to get offended when I buy you a 10 and you know you're really a 14. Stop playing. So I, I've given up on trying to figure people out. I go to the mall, I go to the, the shopping mall, and I buy people uh, Visa gift cards, amen, with money on it. You can pick out your own gift for Christmas, amen? amen. God bless you. If you want to know anything about a person, you have to go straight to the person and ask them. I love this scripture because they want to know how do I get through to God? So they see Jesus and they ask Jesus, how do we pray? They ask, you missed it. They ask God how to pray to God. So Jesus is sitting there and he's like, well, fellas, I thought you would never ask. Uh, if you're going to pray, you should always study. You know, Jesus was, he was loving that. He said, yeah, yeah, I'll tell you how to, I'll tell you how to ask God a question in prayer. Uh, whenever you start off a prayer, you ought to talk to God like this. Start off with calling him father. Amen. Oh, I can see him in there. He said, if you're going to ask me, oops, I mean, if you're going to ask God questions, you want to start off by calling me, I mean, calling God daddy. Makes sense to me. We want to know how to get through to God. Makes sense to go to God and ask him, God, what do you like to hear in prayer? God, how do you like to be addressed in prayer? God, what should we say to you to get results in prayer? Are you still trying to guess? Are you still trying to figure God? Are you still trying to, try to, try to figure out? Well, I think, God, you might like it better if I, if I pray to you on a Tuesday versus a Wednesday. Are you, you still trying to, you still sitting there struggling, I might add, trying to figure out what God likes? Like the disciples, they say, I'm going to ask God what God likes. I'm going to ask God what God likes. Jesus, God enrobed in human flesh, tells them, when you pray, you start off by calling him Father. But here, let me, let me, let me break it down for you. To, to use the word Father was almost taboo for Hebrews. Why? Because up, at, up to that point, they had such a, 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 a high respect for the Lord that, that considering him anything as, as human or anything less than God would be a slap in his face. Why? Because they had an Old Testament mentality that says that God is unapproachable. That's what makes Jesus say, call him father more, more, more. That's what makes me more happy about how Jesus says, call me father. Because here it is, you have God dispelling the myth. He said, for years you thought I was unapproachable, but I'm here to tell you I'm family. Just call me daddy. I ain't approachable. I know, they, I know they taught you little Jewish boys that in the synagogue when you were growing up. You can't talk to God like that. You can't wear that when you go to talk to God. You can't say those words when you talk to him. He said, fellas, I'm family. Just call me daddy. Jesus. The word there, though, the word, that's what I love about it, Joe. It gets jiggy right here. The word there in father, uh, uh, Erlene, I was always taught that the word father there meant Abba, not so. The word there for father in Greek is a word called pater, which is short for paternal. Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. I'm here to tell you for somebody, you've been confused about who God is all your life. Well, today we're going to have a paternity test, amen. We're going to settle this today. He is your father. He's your daddy. And some of us, we have problems with that because I have problems with recognizing him as my daddy. I, I have problems with the paternity of God. Why? Because it's hard for me to recognize him as a daddy when I got daddy issues. Uh -oh. How can I see him as my heavenly father when I ain't never seen my earthly father before in my life? 
struggling. I see it. You, you're struggling because you bringing your daddy issues to God, and God is letting you know I ain't him. That's when God starts operating in that shaggy ministry. It wasn't me. I'm not going to do you like your earthly daddy did you. They didn't catch that. I'm not going to do you like your earthly daddy did you. I'm not going to do you like every man that's ever come in contact with has failed you. He's letting you know I ain't him. I'm not the one. That wasn't me. I take care of mine. Uh-oh. I'm dealing with, with the side effects that's what I call the side effects, Bill, of having an absentee father. So I bring my side effects of having an absentee father into my relationship with a, with, a, with a heavenly father that's more than accepting, that wants to accept me with all my issues, with all my problems, but I can't quite unite with him. I can't quite get with him because I got too much baggage from not ever having a good relationship with my earthly father. Got daddy issues. Got daddy issues. But God's saying, I ain't like that. I, I, God says, I don't, I don't put other kids before you. I'm not going to do that. I know you've had daddy issues before. He said, I'm not going to put my other kids before you. No, I don't, I don't do that. I, I, I'm not going to reject you and argue about whether or not you're really mine or not. That, that's, I don't do stuff like that. I don't, you ain't got to worry about having those type of issues uh, uh, with me. I'm not guilty of neglect or abuse, amen? And not only that, I take care of my kids all the time. They don't just see me on the first of the, Lord help me. They don't just see me on the first of the month when they need something. I'm more, this is, because some of y'all need to hear this. My, me being father in your life, I'm more than just a check in the mail once a month. I'm more than just somebody you call when you need a new pair of Jordans. Y'all better help me. I'm more than somebody you call when you need tuition for school. I'm more than somebody you call when you need them to pay for the bills. But I'm your father, though. I'm your daddy. Key scripture today. Verse number four. But Jesus gives his students the next important instructions. He said, I want you to do this. After you say, Our Father, hallowed be thy name. I want you to pray. Say this next part of the prayer. I want you to say, Thy kingdom come. Uh-oh. Thy kingdom come. Word kingdom there in Greek means realm. In other words, after you acknowledge him as being your daddy, I want you then to ask for him to bring his kingdom down to earth. Now this messed me up. I need you to understand if you want to get into the presence of God, if you want to see results in your prayer life, you got to do it in a spiritual context. Results in prayer don't happen in an earthly realm unless you can bring his kingdom down. That's why it's so important that when we pray, we pray and operate in the spirit of God. Why? Because you can't access results unless you're in my realm. You don't get results in your realm without bringing down my realm to your realm. This is what I call, this is when heaven and earth collide. When you pray, your prayer should be heaven and earth colliding. That's when I bring the spiritual down to the natural. That's when I make my natural environment my spiritual environment. What just happened? Earth, heaven and earth just collided. Jesus. What? My question is, what on earth is going on in heaven? My next question, I had to ask this question of the text, and, and we're almost done. What does heaven on earth look like? I mean, does it look like what's been described in the Garden of Eden? Does it, does it look like what John described in the book of Revelation? What, what does heaven on earth look like? I need you to put it in context for me, Jesus. I, I need to be able to visualize this. I got I to gotta be able to put my hands on this. What does heaven on earth look like? And I, and I got the question answered. The Lord shows us, if you go back two previous chapters, you go back to Luke, the ninth chapter, 
and the Lord messed me up because there in Luke the ninth chapter, we get a glimpse, a trailer, a sneak preview. We get some hidden footage, uh-oh, by a cop car camera. Y'all better help me. We get some hidden footage of what heaven on earth looks like. It goes something like this. In Luke the ninth chapter, they were on the Mount of Transfiguration. Y'all got to watch me. You better watch me. As they were on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus pulls James, Peter, and John and says, let's go up so that we can pray. It's in this context that while they're on the Mount of Transfiguration, while Jesus is praying, they fall asleep, of course. We know that's, that's nothing new with these guys. They fall asleep while Jesus is praying. But this time, Peter wakes up in the middle of Jesus praying. Scripture says that when Peter woke up in the middle of Jesus' prayer, what he saw was Jesus lit up, all glorified and, and all lit up. He, it was almost like he was bedazzled. Any of y'all got girls in here that like bedazzling? Y'all y'all messing with me. He looked up and he cleared his eyes and, and he was messed up because Jesus' face was glowing and Jesus was blinging everywhere. He was bedazzled. And he sees this figure and he's like, I don't believe this. Not only was Jesus bedazzled, but there was smoke or Shekinah glory around, which signifies that, uh-oh, God is here. Amen. Y'all better help me. So, uh-oh, I know that look. Uh-oh, I know that smell. Uh-oh, I know what that smoke is for. That means, uh-oh, God is here. He sees Jesus lit up. He sees the smoke. He sees that God is here. He sees Jesus talking to two dead men. Yeah, I'm about to work that one. He says, he sees Jesus talking to two dead men and what he sees, what he sees or what he hears rather is God speaking. Oh my goodness, y'all. We're about to go somewhere. He's lit up. God's there, and Jesus is talking to two dead men. I like the context of this because Scripture lets us know that he was talking to two dead men, Moses and Elijah. And God, God blew my mind with this one. We're going to go somewhere, lean. He was talking to Moses and Elijah, two men that were supposed to be dead over a thousand years ago. Oh, my goodness. Moses, we know as the deliverer of the Jewish people. Elijah, we know as the prophet the master prophet of the Jewish people. It's here that Jesus is talking to two dead men and God showed me something. When you're in prayer, uh-oh, you can talk deliverance to a dead situation. It's only in prayer that you can speak prophetically to a dead situation. That only happens in prayer. I'm curious. If you're still bound, when's the last time you spoke prophetically to your dead situation? If you still haven't been delivered, when's the last time you spoke deliverance to a dead situation? I can tell you right now, that only happens in prayer. That only happens when heaven and earth collide. When heaven, when heaven and, and earth collide, that's the only time you ever see when the natural takes on the supernatural. So now when I'm praying, praying is the only time when I'm praying in the spirit, that's the only time that the natural laws don't apply to me. Because what I've been told to in natural, in the natural, I get a yes to in the spirit. What I've been rejected about in the natural, I'm able to obtain and apprehend in the spirit. When I'm praying in the spirit, when heaven and when earth collide, I'm operating in the supernatural. Jesus, somebody help me. Now let's go back to Luke the 11th chapter. Let's rewind back to Luke 11 and 1. So it's with this context, uh-oh, that when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration, when they were watching Jesus pray, they seen Jesus lit up. They seen God talking. They seen a man able to speak to a dead, pro dead prophetic situation and able to speak deliverance to another dead situation. Uh-oh, uh-oh. They see the Shekinah glory of God. 
it is under this context that when they come down from the mountain, you read Luke the 11th chapter where it says, Lord, ask us, can we ask you how to pray? Because when you pray, God speaks. When you pray, you get lit up, which falls in line with scripture because he is supposed to be the light of the world, right? Right, you see. When you pray, people get delivered. When you pray, prophetic goes, goes forward. When you pray, things are moving. When you pray, heaven and earth collides. Now they come to Luke the 11th chapter, verse number one. Teach us how to pray, please. Will you please teach us how to pray? Because cause I want to be, because you, you had me blown away, Jesus, when I caught you talking to two dead men. I got to know, can you show me? How to do, can you show me how to pray? Teach me how to pray. He says, fine, when you pray, first of all, if you want results like that, if you want heaven on earth, if you want to see something in that context, the first thing you do is you got to acknowledge me as your daddy. The second thing you got to do is you actually got to pray for heaven to come down to earth. In other words, Whatever you got going on in your life, no matter how foul, no matter how sick, no matter how horrible, no matter how whack it is, you don't care. Why? Because whatever I'm, about, I'm, I'm in at this current time, whatever my current situation is, it's about my environment is about to change right now. Because I'm about to go forward in prayer and I'm about to start tap, tapping into the supernatural. So whatever you see right now don't apply to me. So even though you see me restrained by my environment, you see me subdued to the things around me, it's about to change right now. I'm about to remix everything you see right now. Because I'm about to, first of all, I'll go to my daddy, and then I'm going to ask him, look, I need you to bring heaven down. When heaven and earth collide. So next thing you ask him for, ask him for your daily bread. The root word of bread there actually means anchor said, you don't need to be anchored every other day because we know you get bread every now and then. He said, no, you need bread daily. Say, you need to be anchored in your word daily. He says, if you want results from prayer, after you get through acknowledging me as father, after you bring my realm down to your realm, he said, the next thing you have to do is you have to be anchored in the word daily. Verse number four, and I'm done. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I missed it. Chris, I missed it when I first read that. I didn't get it at first, man. I didn't get it. I was oblivious to the obvious. Then I had to go back and I read it again. First of all, if you're going to bring my heaven down, if you're going to change your environment, if you want results in prayer, you got to acknowledge me as father, okay? Then you got to ask for my realm to come down to your realm. Third thing is you got to eat bread daily. I know you're saying I don't, I don't, I'm low carbon right now, but you got to eat bread daily. Amen? Go on and double up. Get you a big sourdough portion of bread. Go ahead and get you a rye, a whole wheat version. Go get you a croissant version of bread. Go and get you a hoagie version of bread. Go on and get you a pomper seed version. Go ahead and get you a potato bun version of bread. But eat your bread daily. And if you can't find any more bread, go after the tortillas. Amen. But eat your bread daily. So the last thing you got to do if you want results in your prayer. This messed me up. We read it, but we didn't read it. I'm going to read it for you again. And forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil you keep seeing we our every us what are you showing me Jesus 
saying if you want deliverance, the what I need you to start praying for is other people. The problem is you acknowledge him as your daddy. The problem is you are correct in asking for his spirit to come down. The problem is you do read your word daily. But the issue that I have with you is that you're too selfish when it comes to prayer. You keep praying for your deliverance. You keep praying for your healing. You keep praying for your salvation. He said, no, deliver us from evil. Help our people out. I'm curious, when you go down to pray, is it in the context, Lord, we need you right now. Lord, we need you to deliver this whole house. Lord, we need you to bless this whole house. With, with finances, we need you to deliver us, our we. When you go down to pray, quit being so selfish about you, about you and pray. It's not about you. You keep asking, I need deliverance. I need help. I need you to work. I need you to move. I need you to do, I, 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 uh-uh. He said, deliver us. Forgive us as we forgive everybody else. It's we versus me. That is the Lord's prayer. That is the model prayer. Right there. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in heaven as it is in earth. And forgive us our sins, for we, we, also forgive everyone that is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from it. You ain't nowhere in there. I ain't nowhere in there. Me ain't nowhere in there. Could it be that maybe you keep praying every night about you too much? Could it be that maybe you keep focusing on your stuff too. Why we just got to deliver your daughter? Why we just got to deliver your father? Why we just got to deliver your mother? Why is it always got to be about? Why? Why not? Why aren't we praying, Lord, deliver our unsaved generation? Lord, deliver our afflicted. Lord, provide provisions for our people. Stand your feet. When heaven and earth collide. Who sings that song, Dave? When heaven and earth collide tonight. That's all I kept hearing. It wasn't a spiritual song, but it was in my ear. Amen. <laughs> when heaven and earth collide tonight. When heaven and earth collide. It looks something like that. God is lit up. He's the light of the world. God is speaking to everybody. Notice when God was speaking on the Mount of Transfiguration, he wasn't just talking to Jesus. He was talking to everybody there, dead and alive. When heaven collides with earth, God speaks. God's presence is there. God's lit up. Deliverance and prophecy are taking place. When heaven and earth collide. Somebody, let's be honest. Who here is effective in prayer? Who's here? Who here has gotten all their prayers answered? Please let us know your secret. It's time for you to give up state's evidence right now. We, we want to know what you've been doing. Because for the rest of us, and this challenged me, for the rest of us, we have it seen results in our prayer life like we want. That's why it's year number nine and year number 10, you're still praying for it. That's why you're still praying. When you go home tonight, you're gonna still be praying for what you want. My question is, who's ready to see God move? Who's ready to get prayers answered right now? You ready for it? Who, who, who wants to put this to work right now? Who wants to apply this right now because what I'm about to ask you to do right now 
is I'm about to ask you to get ready right now because I want you to pray and I want you to start believing God right now for some challenges that have come your way, some challenges that have come your family's way. There have been some challenges in your life that you cannot ignore, that you cannot dodge anymore. You need God's deliverance right now. I think we need to start praying under new terms. I think there's new conditions to our prayer right now. Who needs God to move right now? Come on up to this altar. Come on up to this altar.